Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another Tuesday morning cardiology grand rounds. So thanks to Elizabeth, we are now moving into the 21st century, and uh, you will no longer be signing into grand rounds. Hopefully this works. We'll be texting uh, to get our CME, CME credits. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for doing that. Uh, this is a very special Grand Rounds. Welcome. We are honored to have Dr. Roxana Meran here. Uh, Dr. Meran is a professor of medicine, an interventional cardiologist at Mount Sinai. I didn't know this until recently, but she actually trained at uh, University of Connecticut for medicine and then went on to Mount Sinai for her uh, cardiology and interventional cardiology training. Uh, Dr. Meran is a world expert in the field of interventional cardiology, cardiology in general, and clinical trials. She founded an ARO at the uh, CRF in New York and has led some of the clinical trials that have changed the way we practice medicine. Uh, most importantly, and I experienced this as a fellow myself, Dr. Meran is incredibly uh, enthusiastic and passionate about uh, bringing up the next generation of investigators. Uh, especially uh, women who have not been represented in the field as well. So it's a really a big honor, great honor to have someone of her stature come here to give round round. So welcome, Dr. Moran. Hope uh, the journey wasn't too terrible, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you, Tarek. Um, thank you all for spending your morning with me. Um, I, uh, is it okay to go on? Did you all text your CME? <laughs> so we can go on and uh, start. Um, you know, uh, when they asked me, what do you want to talk about, uh, I was thinking about uh, doing women in cardiology, but then I wanted to get more people in here. Uh, hopefully, you'll bring me back. Uh, you'll bring me back here so we can talk about that, because uh, this has been a women in cardiology. I think we are the next force, and the current force, and the next force. And I'm so glad to see so many incredible women right here at, uh, at Yale one that I uh, worked very, very closely for almost 20 years, Alexandra Lansky. It's great to be here. Um, but I thought we would talk about the importance of bleeding and the Twilight study that we just uh, uh, finalized and published. Um, so important for you to note my disclosures uh, based on um, the research grant funding to the institution, and most importantly, that the Twilight study was uh, funded through, uh, an, it was an investigator-initiated study, but funded with AstraZeneca. So uh, for the last decade or so, I've been very much um, worried that we've been very excited about preventing ischemic events, and maybe perhaps we push the envelope too far into pushing patients into a, a bleeding uh, situation. And we found early on an important relationship between bleeding and mortality, and this is a schematic that Deepak Bhatt has in the Brunwald textbook, and I apologize that, his, uh, that the um, reference is not there, but what, what it shows is the conglomeration of the multitudes of different things that happens when a patient bleeds. And at the end of the day, there is this uh, relationship with mortality, and it's not about just true and true and unrelated. There is totally a relationship. It's just that it's a complex one. And it's not just about the fact that you bleed to death, but in, in fact that so many other things happen, including inflammatory processes that can le lead to a, um, an ischemic uh, complication such as uh, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, and then finally death. Very importantly, when a patient bleeds, for whatever reason, we not only stop their aspirin and clopidogrel and their antiplatelet and bleeding-inducing drugs, but we also kind of stop their beta blockers and statins, and we just don't want to know about them. Uh, we, we put them in this other category for whatever reason. There's a lot of data for that as well. But there is that important relationship that shouldn't be missed. And so we dug a little bit deeper into that, and um, uh, almost uh, a decade ago, we, we wanted to understand the influence and this fighting, this, this important sort of battle of ischemia and bleeding, and which one is more important, into a um, time-updated covariate-adjusted model using the ACUITY study, which was a, a, an ACS study looking at bivalirudin, but that's regardless. It was in patients with an acute coronary syndrome. And we looked at what would happen if you had a myocardial infarction, and, and in what way is that related to mortality and responsible 
to the deaths. Uh, if, you know, if you put it into a time-updated covariate model, a Cox-adjusted model. And then we also looked at bleeding at the same level. And importantly, they're both really, really important. And in fact, if you actually put bleeding and a major trend and a and a, related with the transfusion, the attribution to death it results in more deaths in that particular study. So it really makes you think that, well, you know what? Bleeding is important and maybe as important as a spontaneous myocardial infarction or um, the things that we worry most about and try to prevent with our anticoagulation, antithrombotic strategies. And then importantly, we also looked at bleeding outside of the hospital once you left the hospital. And in fact, we found that in a PCI database um, of the ADAPT DES study to be one of the most important predictors of mortality. If you bled outside of the hospital, the hazard ratio was close to four times likely to die. So it is a really, really important uh, parameter to think about. Now, do bleeding avoidance strategies actually save lives? It's a very, very difficult balance, and that's where the topic of why we felt it was important to think about that. And it's not just us to, who's doing this. This is Marco Valjamigli's work from the Tracer study, and what he did is take a look at, again, that same, the fighting, the battle between myocardial infarction and bleeding, and in which, in which level should we start to think much more about bleeding, and it's about those patients who have major bleeding events, um, the BARC 3C and more, there where it absolutely wins over myocardial infarction. So avoiding those kinds of catastrophic bleeding events are crucial if we're going to um, save lives and, and, and come up with strategies in a precision medicine way to make it work well. And then, of course, we said, well, not every patient is going to be protected or should be put into this situation. Who are those patients who are at high bleeding risk? And in fact, we know uh, from our data and others' data that there is about 40 to 50 percent of the time, so one in every two to three patients today in your cath lab undergoing PCI will qualify as a high bleeding risk patient. A patient in whom you really have to figure out the balance of bleeding and ischemic complications with the procedures or the therapies you put them on. And at the moment, there's a huge number of trials that are trying to look at shortening the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy as a bleeding avoidance strategy to protect these patients against stent-related complications, ischemic complications, but also avoid those catastrophic bleeding events. And right now, there's a tremendous number of those, and we're calling them high bleeding risk patients. But are they all, who are these patients? And I think what's happening is uh, every company, every sponsor is trying to kind of game the system to say, well, you know, you're over the age of 75, you fit, you know, you, you're at a high risk for bleeding. And I'm not so sure that that's the case, and that's why the Academic Research Consortium just got together and came up with a definition of using um, uh, you know, uh, high criteria that are major and minor. You need one major or at least two minor criteria to actually get in. But the truth is that this is a very, very important arena for us to kind of not think about that all patients are created equal, that we need to kind of define them into these different risk categories, and one of them is gonna be the high bleeding risk category. The other important thing is that when we are bringing in clinical trials and we're designing studies, especially both in pharma and even in device uh, uh, studies, we're, we're seeing over and over again, whether it's in heart failure, or in PCI with the antithrombotic strategies, we continue to keep stacking therapies. We're nervous about withdrawing what we are used to. The thing that we, we you know, the first thing that showed a great result, aspirin, and we just keep stacking therapies on top of each other. And that really is an unappreciated enemy because you're basically pushing the envelope way too far uh, towards one side of the equation and you might actually cause harm. And so it's not just us, but really the, the, uh, there's a vast amount of literature now is saying, do our clinical trials really meet the societal needs? I think Harlan Krumholtz 
one of the biggest proponents of this where he's really thinking about the society and, and what are we really giving back to society and are we, um, are we looking at clinical trials that could investigate withdrawal of some of these uh, established medications to really evaluate them in lieu of the newer medications, the necessity to keep them on board or to get rid of them, even though they're the cheaper, easier uh, route to go. And so I think this is really a, an important um, uh, reason and one of the reasons why we felt, can we, can we actually safely withdraw aspirin, especially if you have a novel, potent, P2Y12 inhibitor on board, and that was really why we were thinking in that term, in those terms. And back then, in 2014, when we uh, designed Twilight, this was a crazy idea because there was very little to know about withdrawing aspirin in a patient you just put a stent in. Are you out of your mind? We just went through a study that showed that dual antiplatelet therapies are necessary in order to um, protect the patients against stent-related complications. Well, the good news is that the, our technology in stenting has really uh, evolved. Uh, these are really thin struts, um, cobalt chromium, biodegradable polymers now with um, ability to deliver a drug in a very short period of time and, and actually quite safe. And the safety of the profile of the device has, has improved tremendously over the years. And so we felt, well, if you have a potent agent, if you have a machine gun, what is a slingshot <coughs> doing in that, in that uh, process or in that battle? And it wasn't just us. Um, it really was this study um, in 2013 um, published in The Lancet, the Wust trial. Uh, the Dutch investigators really thinking that if you have um, Clopidogrel on board in a patient who needs an oral anticoagulant such as Coumadin, giving aspirin is causing nothing but bleeding. And can we withdraw the aspirin from these patients and get them off of the triple threat of the triple uh, threat of bleeding? And they showed 600 patients, very small number, nothing to change your guidelines about, but certainly something for us to generate an important hypothesis in this arena. And um, they showed a reduction, of course, of all types of bleeding, but the important signal of harm for ischemic um, endpoints was absolutely not there. If anything, it was in the uh, direction of uh, improvement, although one never believes that in a small study, but certainly there was not a signal of harm. And this really set uh, the field forward, certainly in a fit patients undergoing PCI, those patients requiring an oral anticoagulant, and then with the novel oral anticoagulant uh, uh, coming in, incorporation of those in really looking at a bleeding avoidance strategy and keeping uh, the, um, the ischemic benefit. And so um, there was this meta-analysis with dual versus triple therapy really showing a major reduction in the bleeding, uh, bleeding parameters, no question, when you drop aspirin, and then importantly, no real major um, ischemic harm in, 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 the, in, the, in the trials that I've listed here, which include WUST, Pioneer AF, and Redual, those three trials that uh, culminated something close to, I would say, about 5,000 patients or so. And then it was the Augustus trial, the 4,600 two by two factorial design uh, study in a blinded aspirin withdrawal in patients undergoing PCI or presenting with an acute coronary syndrome with a background of a P2Y12 inhibitor, mostly clopidogrel, randomized to a pixaban versus Coumadin, aspirin versus placebo, a very, very good study with a blinded aspirin withdrawal showing that just withdrawing aspirin, just looking at the entire population, and I'm not showing you the apixaban arm, there was a major, major, major reduction in the bleeding endpoints. And uh, certainly 
no difference in the ischemic events in those uh, important, uh, with that important withdrawal. So showing that you really, really can, um, is, is aspirin doing nothing but increasing bleeding? It really gives you uh, those, uh, those important feelings. And then uh, before Twilight was published, I mean, these things were going on all at the same time, but I want to just show you the buildup to, to the Twilight study. None of this was available when we designed the study. So when these things were coming out, I was like, oh, wow, maybe, maybe we, were on, we were going down the right path. Um, but stop DAPT trial actually looked at patients undergoing PCI all comers, and they, for the first time, after a month of the, the patients with high bleeding risk, after a month, they dropped aspirin instead of dropping clopidogrel. Now, who's to say that you should drop the clopidogrel or the aspirin? It was sort of a arbitrary uh, uh, question that the single antiplatelet therapy had to be aspirin was something we've always been used to, kind of something we've been used, uh, we, we never wanted to change. But here, these investigators in Japan dropped um, uh, aspirin, and they showed a, a, a net clinical benefit that included a bleeding endpoint in, in favor of, uh, of the dropping of the aspirin and continuing with clopidogrel after a month. And then, of course, uh, the, um, the Korean investigators followed very closely, almost in the same presentation last year at ACC, where they did show a no difference if you drop, um, after three months, if you drop uh, aspirin. And in fact, uh, the, the endpoints looked great uh, in that realm. So it started to look like, well, maybe dropping the aspirin is the way to go. And then, of course, this year, we're in the 10th um, anniversary of PLATO. The PLATO study, for those of you who might not know, is a study that actually brought ticagrelor to the market. It was an 18,000 patient study with an acute coronary syndrome, STEMI, non-STEMI, unstable angina. These patients were randomized to clopidogrel versus ticagrelor. And as you all know, ticagrelor is a fast-acting, a very, very potent P2Y12 inhibitor, much, much improved uh, platelet uh, inhibition than uh, clopidogrel. And it, they showed um, a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events, stroke, death, stroke, and MI, and also a reduction in mortality. And in fact, if you see this, um, it shows that the safety endpoint was no different. But always beware when you see that something that reduces ischemic events should increase bleeding events if it has to do with an antiplatelet regimen. So it's an important kind of an equation to keep in mind. And so here, they measured all bleeding. And they said, oh, no difference. But actually, non-cabbage-related bleeds were definitely higher with ticagrelor. So there is a price of bleeding that was paid in this, but there was an important endpoint, cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality, which trumps all, which was reduced significantly with incorporating ticagrelor. And so the impact really was very important. There was a change in guidelines. The Europeans put it as a class one, uh, preferring that a ticagrelor in all ACS patients <coughs> with or without PCI. Um, the registry data show, is showing that ticagrelor is increasing. But there were still very important questions, even with this great study. Um, of the 18,000 patients, only about 1,300 of them were enrolled in the United States. Unfortunately, they were not successful in getting a US enrollment. And in fact, it was the US patients who did worse on ticagrelor. Mostly, I'll explain to you why, due to the high dose of aspirin. But we will talk about that because there was an important issue on aspirin um, uh, interaction that needed to be evaluated. And so the lack of benefit in US was something that was always behind the minds. And it was one of the reasons why it took a very long time in the United States to get this going. And it's right here, this, this um, uh, paper in circulation showing that the benefit of ticagrelor was most realized when there was a low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams, and hence there's a black box warning against high dose um, <clears throat> aspirin. And there's very good reasons why there could be an important interaction there, especially 
with a P2Y12 inhibitor and a high <coughs> dose of aspirin where you can attenuate the platelet um, uh, inhibition with the use of those high, um, high dose aspirin. I don't think we can talk about Twilight if we don't discuss the global leaders. This was the largest ever percutaneous coronary intervention study. 16,000 patients, all comers, um, no exclusions whatsoever, a pragmatic design, the kind that, I don't, I don't see Harlan, but the kind that Harlan would like. Everybody was included, and the endpoint was Q wave MI and death. And what was the, um, the experiment was, can we just make it really simple for all, call, all PCI, give them a potent P2Y12 inhibitor up front with ticagrelor, and pair that with aspirin for just one month, and drop aspirin at the end of the month and continue for 23 more months on ticagrelor monotherapy. Very important study. And then the reference strategy was the conglomeration of all the things we're doing right now, aspirin and clopidogrel for stable patients, dropping it at six or 12 months, going to aspirin alone, and in the patients with an acute coronary syndrome, aspirin, clopidogrel for 12 months, and then going to a, um, uh, aspirin alone arm. So a very, and ticagrelor, sorry, ticagrelor for ACS patients. So going to a, a dropping the um, ticagrelor instead of the aspirin. So a very complicated analysis with a um, very important endpoint. Everybody was waiting for this. This was going to be sort of the answer. Can you go to a ticagrelor monotherapy? And they just missed the endpoint for QMI and death. Uh, so they can't claim anything. They went for superiority, which was a very, very lofty um, uh, uh, wish, I think. But they missed it by um, uh, very, very narrowly missed it. But there were a lot of limitations, and this I call this a missed opportunity. Uh, obviously, a, a, when you have a complex design like that, having a, um, a pragmatic endpoint of just mortality and Q wave MI and, and not going after the adherence issues and follow up and all of that could have an important impact on whether or not your experiment works. And so there was also, importantly, this was linked to a single um, uh, stent platform that uh, sponsored the study. There was no United States data. This was completely outside of the United States. And there was no adjudication, and, and there was multiple comparators in the um, control arm. Made it very difficult to understand and what could have been played in there. And then, of course, came in 2019, early on, really, I felt like bad for aspirin. <laughs> it was just like everything was coming out that, well, the effect of aspirin in um, he healthy elderly patients just causes bleeding. Uh, prevention in patients with diabetes doesn't work. Um, and it just made it really um, a great kind of place because at the end of the day, this safety efficacy formula and balance becomes extremely important and difficult for us to figure out. Every day we have to make these decisions in our clinics, in the middle of a procedure, how we proceed could have an important impact on the long-term outcomes of our patients, and the balance is very difficult. And gastrointestinal bleeding is just what aspirin does extremely well. And I think it's an important piece of the puzzle as we start to think about how do we define what is single antiplatelet therapies. So I hope that I have given you a background of why dropping aspirin makes, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Aspirin inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, and that is why it's a great GI sluffer. You know, uh, and it's a, it's a really, really important, um, important piece for our patients to note. And at a very high dose, I didn't show you all the data because I actually want to get to twilight, Inhibiting the prostaglandin, the vasodilator synthesis, aspirin may promote vasoconstriction. 
And it is a weak antiplatelet agent. There's a lot of data for that. And we saw, I showed you that the low dose aspirin was very effective in combination with Ticagrelor and Plato. And this wuss like strategy of dropping aspirin seems to be doing a good job when you avoid bleeding in such a way. You might just do well for your patient. So I thought, I call this a perfect storm. The new potent P2Y12 inhibitors, the much increased focus on bleeding. The concern about the antiplatelet stacking, the unanswered questions after Plato, the missed opportunity with the largest PCI study, global leaders, and then a very important fear of aspirin related bleeding and the lack of primary um, prevention benefits, I thought brought a perfect storm for what was to come, which was the Twilight study. And why is it important is because we have our patients where bleeding and thrombosis are really becoming equal, where you really do want to extend and allow patients to get the benefit of these potent P2Y12 inhibition with an agent like Ticagrelor without the bleeding issues. Can we do that? Can we come up with a strategy? And so it was for that reason that we, um, we designed the Twilight study. Again, I want to make sure it's understood that this trial was coordinated, sponsored by the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and our clinical and data coordinating center um, took the brunt of all the insurance, all of the, all of the work that needed to be done. But there was an important sponsoring organization, AstraZeneca, that makes Ticagrelor, for those of you who don't know. So again, this balancing. Um, of these risks was very important, obviously. But the most important piece was that we really needed to, if we wanted to look at the clinical imperatives of lowering bleeding while preserving the ischemic benefit, we needed to begin thinking about therapeutic strategies that decouple thrombotic from hemorrhagic risk. How can we do that? Can we do that? It's very difficult. And so we felt reducing the duration of aspirin could be away. So the trial hypothesis was that in patients undergoing PCI who are at high risk for ischemic or hemorrhagic complications and who've completed a three-month course of aspirin and ticagrelor, a patient in whom the physician, the clinician wants to send home on aspirin and ticagrelor, that at the end of that three months, a ticagrelor monotherapy strategy without aspirin could actually be superior to ticagrelor plus aspirin in reducing bleeding, but much more importantly, it would not cause ischemic harm. So very important that, of course, our primary endpoint was set to win, but the really important piece was to make sure we're not causing ischemic harm. So the primary objective was set for that primary endpoint of the superiority hypothesis of showing that ticagrelor monotherapy was going to be better than dual antiplatelet therapy. But the secondary objective, the key secondary objective of the major ischemic events, which was a hard endpoint of all cause mortality, non-fatal myocardial infarction or stroke, had to be on an equal level and no different. This was a randomized, prospective, double-blind placebo-controlled trial conducted at 187 sites in 11 countries around the globe. You had to get, you got in if you used a locally approved drug eluding stent, because bare metal stents are out, hopefully you all know that already, in whom the treating physician, clinician, wanted to send that patient home on aspirin and ticagrelor. So already there's a decision making that this patient needs a potent agent ticagrelor plus aspirin on their way home. And then you need it on top of that, have an additional risk factor, either clinical or angiographic features that would give you a little bit of a event rich in both ischemic or bleeding complications. And here they are. The clinical criteria was age greater than 65, a female gender associated with bleeding, a troponin positive ACS associated with both bleeding and an ischemic complication, 
Establish vascular disease outside of the heart uh, or previous MI, uh, 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 PAD. Um, diabetes requiring medication. Chronic kidney disease, these are all the clinical criteria that enrich this patient population on top of just wanting to send them home on that. And then important angiographic criteria that gave the anatomical feel of a highly burdened cardiovascular coronary artery disease with uh, target lesion requiring a long stent, um, bifurcation lesion requiring two stents, a left main disease, or calcific lesions. These were the enrichment criteria on the angiographic side. We excluded, it's really important to actually focus on this trial because this is not for everyone. You know, we didn't want cirrhotic liver cirrhosis patients or patients who bled or have a low life expectancy. Important ones, important ones were STEMI was excluded. So we're hoping to do twilight STEMI next, now that we've figured this out. But a dialysis dependent renal failure is not there. Very important need for oral anticoagulation was not there. Remember, in our guidelines, it's a class three to put ticagrelor with an oral anticoagulant. It's class three in a lot of the, in the European guidelines, certainly, and, and, and it's with, um, with care in our own guidelines. So uh, you could see, I, I keep that up because these are the patients who would not fit this strategy. This is not for everyone. And I got very scared after I presented and I was at a, uh, symposium where everyone said, well, on Monday, I'm going to use this strategy. I was like, no, make sure you know to who to exclude. The trial was organized by a large number of very, very dedicated, engaged country leaders, executive committee, steering committee. The data coordination, clinical coordination was all at Mount Sinai. We had a great uh, CDC. We had stroke adjudication by board certified neurologists from the New York City area. So it was a really, really well-conducted study. And here's how it was designed. There was an open enrollment period that everybody got in. Um, and you basically uh, were high-risk PCI undergoing, going home on aspirin, ticagrelor, open label. And all of that was supplied. We didn't want any issue with adherence. So we gave the drugs to everybody. And at three months, you had to come in. You had to be seen by the site. You had to get your pills counted to make sure you were adherent, and you were ascertained for bleeding or ischemic uh, uh, endpoints. And if you didn't have, and you were event-free, and you were compliant, you passed the hurdle of being eligible for randomization, and then you had to agree to these crazy follow-ups and pill counts and all those things, because there is when the experiment began with a placebo now added as a study drug versus aspirin, completely indis indistinguishable. And everyone received a month after a phone call, then six months after an in-person visit with pill counts, looking for adherence, and then again at 12 months after randomization with the same exact view. And then once the, it was done, we allowed for standard of care to take place, looking for a rebound uh, timing. And at that time, for three months, patients were followed as well in open observational period. So the primary endpoint was a bleeding BARC-235, um, zero to 12 months after randomization, superiority hypothesis. The key secondary endpoint was a non-inferiority hypothesis with a non-fatal stroke uh, MI or all-cause mortality. We used um, uh, a 4.5% bleeding endpoint for BARC 2, 3, and 5 based on what we knew from previous studies. We needed a sample size of 8,200 uh, patients to actually show we were very modest. We thought we would get about 28% reduction uh, in our uh, bleeding endpoint by dropping aspirin because ticagrelor is a, you know, is a, is a potent agent. And then uh, we assumed a one, rate, one year rate of 8% um, um, uh, death MI uh, CVA in this patient population and allowed a very small margin of 1.6% with a type 1 error of 0 0.025. Uh, and we needed 9,000 patients to get enrolled, 8,200 patients to be randomized and um, to, to, to meet uh, these, uh, these criteria. Um, it's important to note that the entire primary endpoint was on, a, on an intention to treat analysis, 
is the way it needed to be done. But the key secondary endpoint, which was a safety endpoint, even though it's an ischemic endpoint, became our safety endpoint, uh, was on a per protocol, which is the way it should be to make sure there's no harm when you're going into those treatments. Here's how it went. The, this was really a global study. We were in uh, North America, United States finally made up 36% of the patient population. We had a, a very great representation of, of Europe um, as well as India and China. So we really did have, we just weren't in Australia, but we were everywhere else. And it was very similar in our randomized patient population. And here's how it went. 9,006 patients enrolled, 7,119 randomized. We didn't get to the 8,200 patients. We didn't have funding to keep going. And our data safety monitoring board said, you're fine, keep going, and you're, you're OK. And 1,887 patients were not randomized due to uh, important uh, bleeding, ischemic endpoints, non-adherence, physician choices, et cetera, et cetera. But we ended up with 7,119 event-free patients who were adherent who wanted to come back for follow-up. We randomized them. We had primary endpoint analysis and ascertainment of events in 98.5% of the patients and vital status of 99.5% of the patients. We really looked for every single patient around the world. We also felt it was very important that if this experiment is gonna work, there has to be adherence. So the pill counts, we looked for adherence and anything above 80% is really, really good. And these patients did very, very well, both at um, six months and at um, 12 months, both with um, uh, ticagrelor as well as the placebo or aspirin. So here's how it went. Randomization works. Um, there was absolutely no difference between the baseline characteristics, but let me show you what kinds of patients were in there. The mean age was a little bit older than the usual PCI patient population, about 65 years of age. We had 37% diabetic patients, 10% um, insulin requiring, chronic kidney disease in 17%, anemia in 20%, and 64, 5% of our patients had multivessel disease. These were high burden of atherosclerosis in an elderly patient with multiple risk factors. The procedural criteria are shown here. Again, worked extremely well with randomization, mostly radial access, showing us a very contemporary bleeding avoidance strategies in these patients with 73% radial, Multivessel disease, again, 63% of the patients. Uh, lesion morphology, as you could see here, calcific lesion. The stent length was 40 millimeters. These were, you know, really um, uh, tough, uh, tough patients. So if you wanted to know what happens if you leave patients on aspirin and ticagrelor in this patient population over a period of one year after Actually, it's 15 months, right? So they received it at time zero, three months of aspirin ticagrelor. Then they went on for aspirin and ticagrelor for 15 months. They had a bleeding rate of BARP 2, 3, and 5 of 7%. T taking out the aspirin reduced this to 4%. This was a 44% um, uh, uh, relative risk reduction. Um, with an absolute reduction of, of 3% and the numbers needed to treat of only 33. A very, very dramatic reduction, even after you already sieved out the high bleeding, difficult patients in the first three months after enrollment. Everyone said, well, you included BARC-2, so this is all minor bleeding. Actually, it really wasn't. BARC-2 includes clinically relevant bleeding, but Looking at BARC 3 and 5, we also show a major reduction, a 50% reduction. Uh, and um, if you look at any bleeding parameter, there was a major reduction in bleeding. There's no question, you drop aspirin, you will reduce bleeding. And whether it's gusto, whatever you're used to, whatever is on your, on your palate that you think is a better bleeding parameter, there really was a major reduction, all p-values being statistically significant in this patient population. But this was the most important thing. So what if you reduce bleeding, but if you have a, an important negative benefit in a per protocol analysis, it was basically exactly the same. You absolutely did no difference between um, 
uh, when you dropped aspirin in those important uh, hard endpoints of death MI and stroke. And this, you can look at this with every single one of the, the, the parts of the composite, and we make nothing of the fact that the, numerically there was less death, numerically there was less stent thrombosis, MI was exactly the same, and numerically stroke was in the different direction. So there was a um, 0.5 versus 0.3 percent difference in, in the stroke, ischemic stroke. If we look at the sub-analysis um, with these pre-specified um, uh, subgroups, we show uh, uh, in the primary endpoint of bleeding, absolutely benefit across all the subgroups. In fact, in the ACS patient population, it looks like there is, you know, the, it's a nominal P of 0.03, but an important one because those are the patients in whom you really want to go for a long period of time. Can you drop aspirin? And it looks like you might be able to, but we will show these data as a late-breaking trial at AHA in a much, much more detailed uh, fashion. But that was an important subgroup to look at. And then, of course, um, on the ischemic endpoint, you see everything sort of hovering around the line of unity, not showing any interaction whatsoever. What about during the open observation period when they go back? Is there a rebound um, on the, for those patients? We observed absolutely not, not, nothing uh, about that in the, in, with bleeding, nor did we see anything in um, death MI or stroke. So very, very interesting and, and open um, uh, results, simple. Uh, do a simple study, just blind everything. No one knows anything, and then no one ever questions you about what you did and how you did it. So blinding is really a good thing. It was terribly difficult, but it's a good thing to do because then your work is done when you present your uh, trial. But it is important to know that there are huge limitations, even though we, I think we did a really good job with this trial. This is not generalizable to everyone. You had to go through that stress period of three months of of, of dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor. It is really important to note that we had a lower than expected. We, we expected 8%, we only got 3.9%. So again, we the key secondary endpoint, when you have that, uh, there, it could bias our results toward, towards the null. So I still would caution you in certain patients uh, that maybe uh, you know it's important. And there's a very important lack of power to detect uh, differences in some of these rare clinical events like stroke, stent thrombosis, or even mortality. So I think it's important to note those. But nonetheless, in these high-risk patients, um, the twilight-like patients, after three months, uh, a antiplatelet strategy of continuing ticagrelor monotherapy did result in substantially less bleeding than ticagrelor plus aspirin without increasing ischemic events over a period of one year. We were very lucky to be in the New England Journal. It was my first publication there. And I was very, very, uh, as a first author, and I, was, I worked a lot on a lot of trials, but this was the first one, so I'm very proud of it. But I also want to just quickly give a lot of credit to my colleague, Usman Barber, and our group at Mount Sinai, because they also, not only did he help me, and he's a co-primary author with me in the, main, uh, in the main paper, but he also did a very, very important study, which is the platelet sub-study, which will be published in Jack very, very soon. It was important because we knew we were going to be underpowered for these rare clinical events. And the blood thrombogenicity could have an important impact in understanding the biological issues that is going on in here. And this was the largest uh, platelet function study in a blinded uh, uh, subgroup. In, at, at Mount Sinai, we randomized uh, 128 patients, approached 51 patients, and put them in the uh, PD study. And um, they, um, they came back. At, at the time of randomization, they had blood drawn. And I'll show you what we did uh, as far as the, the Batamon chamber. And then they came back, and then we measured blood thrombogenicity and looked at that, and the primary endpoint was looking at blood thrombogenicity. And here's what we did. These patients came in, they had their blood drawn, and we put the, um, the whole blood into this water bath uh, in, the, in the chamber that has this thrombogenic substrate, which is the tunica media of a, of a disrupted tunica media of the pig aorta. And in low to high shear, we're able to actually get the blood going through the chamber, then look at the, uh, the thrombus area and quantify this. And this was a very important sub-study with uh, 51 patients blinded, but since we were blinded, 
we ended up a little bit unbalanced, uh, ended up with 18 um, in the placebo arm patients and 24 in the uh, dual antiplatelet regimen. But it's really important to see that basically there was absolutely no difference in blood thrombogenicity, just like what we saw with the clinical endpoint. And so that was a really, really important um, important study, we met the non-inferiority endpoint and met the fact that there was absolutely no difference. And the changes in thrombus area was absolutely no different between ticagrelor oral and placebo and ticagrelor oral plus aspirin. Importantly, platelet reactivity was verified by the fact that in um, presence of arachidonic uh, or absence, you know, when you have no aspirin and you're testing in arachidonic acid and collagen, there was more uh, aggregation and so that's an important validation of, of the work but importantly it showed that this really did corroborate uh, that there was a similar antithrombotic effect that um, the uh, the findings uh, with aspirin withdrawal completely corroborated with our clinical uh, studies and I thank you for your attention Lisa's 10 minutes for discussion <laughs>